Megan fumed about her impotence because every rant that Thomas and Samantha gave dented her popularity. I mean, yeah, because these people, we would assume, have some kind of inner knowledge. The previous day, photographers had noted the accuracy of Thomas's observation as far as her pained smile and her discomfort whenever she was around the royal family. On a, uh, in a staged photo opportunity to rebut the truth, Megan and Kate had appeared for the first time together at Wimbledon for the ladies' final. Megan's smile looked forced and looked more forced than usual. And that's probably because standing right next to Catherine gave an unflattering optic for Megan. Now, here's the thing. We all have our different feelings about Meghan Markle's physical appearance. I feel like she has a pretty face, but I'm already 100% with you guys. When I first started talking about Meghan Markle, I said in previous videos that I thought she was stunning because I've never really done it. I'd never done a deep dive on Meghan. What did I care? I didn't like comb photos of her and find pleasure in degrading her physical appearance. It meant next to nothing to me what she looked like. I mean, I'd scan magazines and be like, oh, I like that outfit or whatever when she was with the royal family. I thought a lot of her clothes were really pretty when she was with the royal family. I liked the style. Whoever her stylist was, I thought she always looked really nice, very clean lines, very tailored, very beautiful. And I think she has a really pretty face. Um, her physical appearance, though, below the neck is a little unusual, I will say. I think she has a figure that would be very difficult to dress, and stylists in the past have said so about Megan, that she's difficult to dress. Um... And I don't want to waste any of my breath or time degrading somebody because, you know, we're given the bodies we're given, you know. So that's neither here nor there. But I will say that if people were in the mood to compare the two, not many of us could stand next to Catherine and feel like we were the most beautiful person in the room. I mean, even if we'd been made up and were beautiful and dressed to the nines and our makeup was perfect and all this was perfect... When you stand next to Catherine, she's just a physically beautiful person. But even before that, we've come to love her because she, her character is very beautiful. So we still want to favor her in, in almost every scenario. And if Megan had had a really beautiful character and we just saw her as genuine and care and loving, I really, really, really doubt that people would have jumped so quickly on the comparison here. But the thing is, is that, you know, it's just such an easy and... Uh, it, it, it's such low-hanging fruit to attack physical appearance when you already don't like someone. Is it a junky, low-class tactic? Absolutely. But anyway, a lot of people were willing to do that, and Megan knew they would. So she looked very uncomfortable during that um, time and, and in those pictures. But mirroring the discomfort between those two women was the discomfort between William and Harry, who were later seen at the 100th anniversary of the Royal Air Force. They both looked very uncomfortable together. So cracks are beginning to appear and people are beginning to chatter. What's going on with these two? And what's going on with the women? And what's, you know, why, why can't we all just get along? What about the Fab Four? Well, like, did that, like, that fizzled out after two seconds. The relations between the four were aggressively breaking down. Now they wouldn't even be anywhere near each other. William and Kate refused to stay with Charles and Camilla when they were in Scotland at the same time as the Sussex. And the Sussex turned down the Queen's traditional invitation to stay at Balmoral in the summer with William and Kate. At the heart of their divergence was Meghan's unwillingness to be part of a team. There was no intimacy. She could not identify with the family's power, social, financial, or political. And she was also irritated by Kate and William's refusal to be well-meaning partners. So... Now it's not just like people quietly muttering to each other. I don't like so-and-so. Why did she do that? What's going on with this? Why is she so... It's like now it's like the whole family is, is being disrupted now because of Megan. At the same time, in, uh, on the 20th of July, there well, it was decided that Megan needed a little bit more positive PR and it needed to go out that she was being warmly embraced by the family because people were starting to have questions like what what is going on with William and Catherine? You know, and, and Harry and Meghan, like, why don't the young people like each other? So they decided to come out with this sort of message that, okay, well, there might be problems with William and Catherine, but there's no problem with Charles. Everybody, Charles likes Meghan, okay? Everybody, it's, they, 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 they have a special bond. They don't. Um, but they decided to take this opportunity for Meghan to go and visit Charles in Scotland at the castle. And it was put out that Meghan and Charles... Uh, got along because he admired her interest in history and furniture. 
I don't know what we've heard thus far about Megan that would show that she had any interest in history. Every time anybody tries to tell her anything on a tour about the history of Britain, anytime anybody wants to talk to her about anything that has happened that does not involve her, she's no interest in it whatsoever. And I said this when I read Spare, on this very same occasion, because Harry mentions this same occasion. So interesting. Spare, okay, side note, Spare was made up of all of his all, all of the clippings that had ever been and all of the newspaper clippings about his life. Anything that had ever gone out by a PR agency about him, anything that the palace had ever said about him, any article that had ever been written, Spare was, had only used that information. And then a couple of his rambling memories that we couldn't figure out how, why he tried to stitch those in. The palace had put this story out that Charles and Meghan really got along and that he really admired her and thought that she was a, a sophisticated thinker. And I called BS on it then because Meghan is not a sophisticated thinker. You can hear it in the way she talks, in the way that she misuses phrases. Look, I misuse phrases all the time too. I am constantly mispronouncing things or saying things wrong. You know, you talk for an hour, you find out how many things you can't say right, okay? So... I'm not trying to point a finger at her, but I'm also not coming to you being like, I'm the most educated person in the world. I've repeatedly said that I am not. And Megan wanting everybody to think that she's this, the smart one, the intellectual one, she wanted a story to go out from the palace that would say Charles admired her because Charles is known for his intellect. And Charles is known as an academic. He's known as a lover of history. He's known as somebody who has a taste for higher things. So for Megan and him to have, you know, this special little relationship of the intellectuals would have given her some kind of credibility. And so Harry makes mention of that in Spare. And now we're hearing that it was actually not that they liked each other so much. It was designed that, they, that she should go so that they could write about how wonderful the relationship was. Do you see what I'm saying? It, it, it wasn't a natural Let's go see Pa. Let's go hang out with Pa. It was, hey, Megan, make sure you go see Charles because we need to write a story about how you guys get along. Now, the reality was, the unspoken reality, was that Charles didn't get Megan at all. And he never understood. He never understood this American. He was bewildered by her. He never really understood her or what she wanted. And that week, his irritation about Thomas Markle's TV appearances, especially his criticism of the royal family, came to a head. And Charles had a little meeting with with Harry and he said can't she just go and see him and make this stop and that's everybody's question why is this continuing to happen when all she has to do is pick up the phone um Charles apparently berated Harry in this conversation his son according to Megan was endlessly explaining the situation about Thomas Markle's behavior to Charles and Camilla but the family seemed to forget the context and they fundamentally just don't understand what is happening that is, that's a direct quote from Megan, that even though Harry had to endlessly explain the situation, Charles and Camilla were too dense to figure it out. You know, basically, they were just being willfully ignorant about the whole thing. Because we've been talking to them about it over and over, and they keep asking us the same questions, and it's just getting really hard because I don't know how else to help them understand this. My father is a vile human being, and he has made it um, incredibly clear that he wants to hurt me and destroy me. I don't know why I should go and have a conversation with somebody who wants to hurt and destroy me. That seems a little bit dangerous. Well, Charles could not understand Harry's explanations because his son withheld critical details. Of course, Harry didn't say that Thomas is super mad because Megan won't answer his phone calls. Charles didn't realize how much Thomas had reached out and why Thomas was so angry. And he was so, his fury wasn't necessarily just because he wanted to get on TV and can complain. It was because Megan was ignoring him and now he was trying to, to get some attention from her. And Harry also held back that he had insulted the man while the man lay in the hospital sick. So you, you withhold those two things, you're going to have to keep explaining because the, the narrative is never going to be clear. I'm sure that Harry told his dad the story in the same way he told us all his stories in Spare, where we were left going, what are you talking about? There's too many holes in this story to make any kind of sense. How many times did I say that when we were reading Spare? That he was giving us one-fourth of the details and then holding back anything that would make him or Megan look bad. Well, that's exactly the story that Charles is getting, exactly the story the Queen is getting. And both of them are like, son, you're lying. Well... Uh, 
to because they couldn't tell the truth about why Thomas wasn't because they couldn't tell the truth about why Thomas Markle was so angry, they had to come up with this conspiracy theory. They claimed that the reason Megan could not reach out to her father was because they didn't believe his phone was in his possession and they thought his email account was compromised. Now, remember, they had zero evidence of the phone not being in his possession or his email being compromised. Megan had cooked up this lie with Harry and Megan had told Harry, this doesn't sound like my dad. And then Harry had, he jumped right on that dramatic narrative. This, you know, uh, this idea that somehow her father had been compromised by, you know, some shadowy and inexplicable force. And that, you know, he was working with somebody. Who could it be? Who could know? We don't know. But something's going on here. And, and he just loved the conspiracy of it. Drama-loving, immature Harry loved the idea that her father, this villain, was now under the control of yet a greater villain. And we can't even go into these dark waters because who knows if the villain will then swallow us whole. Well, the inconsistencies of Meghan's excuses not only irritated Charles, but also the Queen. Because regardless of whether the Sussexes had lied to themselves to the point of believing this conspiracy theory, the Queen and Charles were not willing to wade into these dramatic waters. And they knew exactly that this was just a couple of sullen teenagers coming up with some reason why they hated dad. The monarch did not believe that Meghan could not resolve her differences with Thomas Markle. And to persuade her to make an effort, she joined Charles in a conference call with Meghan and Harry. At the outset, Charles and his mother urged Meghan to fly to America for a reconciliation. Now, in spare, on the same trip to Scotland... This is the, the trip where they go and sing to seals and, you know, make magic wishes and then Meghan gets pregnant. On this same trip, Harry claimed that the queen called Meghan out of the blue just to speak to her. And she suggested that Meghan write a letter to her father to help him understand the way the world, you know, to help him understand and, and, and to extend an olive branch of love and affection and to please ask him to stop talking to the media. That never happened. There was a call, but it was a call to explicitly explain to her the necessity of her visiting him in person. Well, Megan, of course, comes back and says, and I think she said this in the Oprah interview, that it was completely, unre un it was completely unrealistic to think I could fly discreetly to Mexico, arrive unannounced at his doorstep, as I had no means of secure communication with my father, to a location and residence I had never visited or, or known in a small border town, and somehow hope to speak privately to my father without causing a frenzy of media attention and intrusion that could bring more embarrassment to the royal family. I mean, God forbid it. Why should I... I had no way of navigating such a complicated international journey. Did they understand what they were asking me? Fundamentally, they could not have understood what they were asking me to do, or they never would have even suggested I do something so strange and so odd and so beyond the bounds of reality. Uh, Megan, are you an invalid? Why is this so difficult? You get on a plane and you fly. You know, it's like, what about all these private planes you suddenly have access to at various points? There's a thousand ways that this could have been arranged. And I, I mean, I covered this in spare. If you really think that he is not operating on his own, there's ways to find that out, okay? You've got real power at your disposal to find this stuff out, but you didn't want to. And, and this kind of lame excuse, I hate this kind of BS, where people, like, they give you this lame excuse and then they're mad when you don't accept it. When you're like, that's not true, though. That's not a thing. It's not a thing that you can't fly to Mexico discreetly. You've, how about when Harry was flying to meet you constantly and continually in Canada? Somehow there was never a media frenzy there when he would show up and he was the prince. So why don't you ask him how he did it? Maybe he can give you a couple of tips. Her argument avoided the truth, says blunt Tom Bauer. Although her father's telephone number was un unchanged and the mobile was always in his pocket, she claimed, I had no secure means of communication with my father. And added, we could not trust that my father's phone was in his possession. Yeah, but you can't trust that it's not either because you don't know either way. So why don't you at least make an attempt? Even if you thought that he was, his phone wasn't in his possession, at least reach out to the man and show kindness. 
there's there's no consequence for kindness. Just be nice. But even Tom Bauer says that even if she thought that her father's phone wasn't in his possession, she could have still contacted him. Her father's telephone number had remained unchanged. They could have met in, discreetly in Los Angeles. The queen wasn't aware that Megan had never visited Rosarito. So, you know, that's why she suggested you should just go to Mexico and see your dad. But if Megan was really that unfamiliar with the area, okay, well then let's go where you're both familiar. Go to LA. But whatever needs to be done, meet with your dad and quote this sad, sorry excuse making. Both Charles and the queen realized that Megan's excuse was far-fetched. Puzzled by her attitude, neither Charles nor the Queen had heard Thomas Markle's explanation for Meghan's stubborn refusal to meet him, namely that Doria had persuaded her daughter not to make that journey. The conference call ended with both the senior royals perplexed by Meghan's conduct. I was especially sensitive, Meghan later admitted, to this as I had very recently married into the family and I was eager to please them. No, what she really means is this was really hard for me because I am not used to being pressed by people that I can't control and I'm not used to being pressed by people who intimidate me. I'm used to doing the intimidating and I felt very uncomfortable in the scenario because I wanted to have the upper hand and I knew that I was dealing with people who were not going to swallow my lies hook, line, and sinker because I could not help them in any way. We've said this before, Megan has moved up in the world because she has been able to find people who are just low enough below her to use them as stepping stones. So she just has found people in her life who she can manage and manipulate and who she can show some facet of her personality that attracts them so that she can come suck anything they have out that can help her and then discards them. Well, the queen is never going to be a person that is even in her sphere. So here she has somebody who is significantly elevated above her, who she can never manipulate or manage. And she hates the feeling that she can't gain an upper hand. She can't find some footing. She can't find some wording, some sentence, some phrase that will manage to make them buy her story. They just don't buy it. And that's what made her uncomfortable. It wasn't that I was eager to please him having recently married into the family. Meanwhile, Harry's over there wringing his hands like a baby that he is. He was fretting that Meghan needed his protection. He sympathized with her resentment about the palace's keen sense of deference and hierarchy. While he could not understand her intolerance of English reserve, he did fear that he might still lose her. It would be the greatest boon if you did. I just don't understand why Harry needed her this much. I, I can only chalk it up to the fact that he is rather intellectually dull and hasn't grasped the fact that she is manipulating him. I think that he finds her to be somehow an intoxicating breath of fresh air because she does and says all the things he wants to but can't figure out how to say himself. So he was drawn to her sense of rebellion. But now, I mean, you want to talk about somebody that's got a boot on on his neck. I mean, Megan has such a boot on his neck and he's like over there gasping for breath and but so unaware that She's not help. I mean, she's not helping him in any way. I don't know why he is so deferential to her. I cannot understand it. Megan continues to use her favorite word. They fundamentally don't understand. Megan complained during her visit to the castle in Scotland. They included Camilla. With nothing in common, Camilla was apprehensive about Harry's future. Now, this is an interesting sketch that Tom Bauer gives us of Camilla. You will tell me what you think of this. Camilla epitomized the best and probably some of the worst characteristics of a practical, solid English upper middle class woman. Undereducated, expert as a horsewoman, a poor cook, keen to do good with lots of good friends, she was grounded and not grand. As a no-nonsense, self-deprecating, plain speaker with a good sense of humor who, when necessary, displayed a stiff upper lip, Camilla was most comfortable sloshing through the mud in a barber and gumboots. For the hard-working American graduate and feminist brought up enjoying the sunshine by the Pacific, the class-ridden hunting world galloping across the English shires in invariably under leaden skies was unattractive. The stark difference between the Cotswolds and California aroused Camilla's sense that Megan was an adventuress from Los Angeles. But unlike Charles, Camilla could see through the American actress's coitish smiles and tactile performance. During her lifelong experience among English's country set, Camilla occasionally spotted self-important adventuresses. They were the sort she called a minx. So 
Camilla may have remained tight-lipped. And Megan did too during her stay at the castle. They weren't at odds with each other on the visit, but they both sort of remained unsure of how to navigate the other. Both of them were wary of one another, and both of them were uncertain as to how this was really going to sort itself out. But neither of them took a shot at each other, probably because they both realize they're pretty evenly matched as far as taking each other down. Uh, so it's best to remain sort of hedging around each other. Harry, of course, had his own reasons for distrusting Camilla. He still blamed her for wrecking his parents' marriage. So, I mean, he's not he's not a sophisticated player in this disagreement. Frustrated that she could not communicate with her admirers on the internet, Megan was angry that palace officials refused to protect her image. She refused to accept that Jason Knopf and the staff were not employed to promote her as an individual, but instead placed her within the grid of the entire royal family. In particular, Megan fumed about Knopf's refusal officially to criticize Thomas Markle. Knopf, she complained, rejected her orders to set the record straight by, re by directly engaging with the media to ask newspaper editors not to interview Thomas on the grounds that he was being groomed and exploited. That wasn't enough for her. She didn't want it to be suggested that he was being groomed and exploited. She wanted the blame to be placed squarely on his shoulders. She wanted the world to know he was a terrible, horrible person who was trying to use and abuse her uh, fame and popularity. And she wasn't willing that there should even be any kind of sympathetic idea pitched about him by the palace. Like, let's just leave this guy alone. They're manipulating him. He's just confused. Megan's like, he's not confused. He knows exactly what he's doing and you should call it out. From her perspective, Megan was isolated, vulnerable, and stifled by conventions. Unwilling to accept that, unlike Hollywood, no one was counting the box office receipts of the crowds she attracted, she was waging a struggle for which she was not suited, nor properly understood. Scornful of the palace's explanation that attacking the media would rebound on her, she adopted Hollywood's rule book and secretly took the initiative. Okay, so who should we see arrive back on the scene? Gina Nelbergown. And Gina has come to the surface again because she um, gave an unfavorable interview to the Mail on Sunday. And in this proposed article, Nelthorpe Cowan described Megan as picky, not only when it comes to her clothes, but also her colleagues, instantly dismissing those who didn't share her vision. Describing how the Duchess had given her a bit of a difficult time in Edinburgh, she observed that Megan likes to move on. Now... The interview had been given, but I don't believe it had been published when Megan found out about it through Knopf. Megan was invited by the newspaper to give a comment, but instead of commenting, she called up Jessica Mulrooney and said, here's your marching orders, girl. I want you to go and harass that editor until he, his ears are bleeding. Well, for whatever reason, Jessica Mulrooney did it, and she called Adrian Sington, the literary agent, for more than two hours, she harangued him in what he politely described as a very unpleasant way. Subsequently, Gina Nelthorpe Cowan accused Milrooney of putting pressure on me to withdraw or change statements. After a complaint by the newspaper to the palace about Megan's conduct, Knopf said that he would ensure this does not happen again. So this is how it is. We remember that Adrian Sington was a literary agent who had worked with Gina Nelthorpe Cowan, and he had been the one who was supposed to put that book together that was going to be sort of like a coffee table book about the TIG, and she, Megan didn't like it because she said that it had talked about sexual things, and there was a chapter about how to be a better woman, and it gave different things that she talked about on the TIG, but suddenly when he put it in the book, she said that he was objectifying her and she threw a, a fit of rage and screamed at him and caused a scene at lunch. Do we remember this? Well, this is the same Adrian Sington. And uh, so I'm not, t I, I feel a little bit confused about the players here because Gina Th Nelthorpe Cowan gave an interview to the Mail on Sunday, which hadn't been published, but I'm not sure why when Megan was called to give the newspaper a comment, she tells Jessica Milrooney to intervene personally and call Adrian Sington, the literary agent. I don't know what role he had played in that interview and why calling and attacking him for two hours was going to help Gina Nelthorpe Cowan pull back some of her comments and withdraw or change statements. I, I don't understand that, except for the fact that Adrian Sington and Gina Nelthorpe Cowan worked together. And... 
perhaps he was involved in that same interview or he had gotten the interview for Gina. I don't understand the relationship there. It is not evident. But whatever, we can boil it down to this. Megan used her power to get her friend to sick her friend on a group of people that she used to work for who she now had great disdain for. Now, Kanoff had said that he would never let Megan do this again, and he had essentially apologized for her behavior, but really, he didn't have any power to say that. The royal family had embraced a media junkie determined to exploit her new status to create a global image. Among those willing to help her was Byrony Gordon of the Daily Telegraph. Of course, it was Byrony Gordon. Byrony Gordon is the one who went out and did that interview about Harry and had talked to him at length about the, his descent into chaos and madness and how he was, you know, pulling up from that, but that it had been quite a season of mental distress for as long as he could remember. And they had bonded over the fact that they both suffered from depression. And though Harry didn't speak about it in that interview, he could have bonded over the fact that both he and Byrony Gordon had issues with alcohol and drugs as well as depression. So Byrony was only all too excited to now side with Megan and to raise her up on a pedestal because she already had an in with Harry and she gets to be their new pet journalist. Byrony wrote of Megan, she does not want to make the mistake of rushing in and giving critics an opportunity to trip her up, wrote Gordon. Like Kate, Megan will not shy away from duty. She has the opportunity to change the world. But all of this, you know, do-goodery and trying to speak well of Megan by comparing her to Kate is not anything the world's going to buy because we're watching Megan. Megan is shying away from duty. She does have an opportunity to change the world, but she won't take it because she's too busy and too wrapped up in all of her own family issues. This garbage about she doesn't want to make the mistake of rushing in and giving critics an opportunity to trip her up, she is rushing in. And she's trying to cover her tracks so her critics won't notice, but she's not stopping her behavior. Why Byrony Gordon felt that she needed to come in and write this puff piece the only thing I can say is she was looking to cozy up to the royal couple, but nothing in this piece made any sense. Curing Byrony Gordon's support, Meghan had misunderstood the media. Her persuasive influence on one journalist's favorable portrayal of herself was an incentive for others to highlight the negative stories. Their search for harmful snippets started after an official visit by Meghan and Harry to Dublin. In a private conversation, Meghan told an Irish politician that she supported abortion. The politician posted the conversation on social media. See right here, what is what in the world is Megan doing saying she supports abortion in Ireland? This is what I'm saying to you. She has no idea about history whatsoever. What in the world was she thinking? How could she have ever let those words fall from her lips that she supports abortion in Ireland? Megan was instantly criticized for expressing a political opinion. During the 24-hour trip, the media delighted in reporting that she wore four outfits worth 28,000 pounds, mostly from one designer. But a quick survey of her last 15 outings showed that she had worn clothes by Dior, Givenchy, Prada, and Chanel, and never the same outfit twice. She was unfavorably compared to Kate, whose annual expenditure on clothes was about £100,000. Guilt by association extended to Buckingham Palace announcement that Princess Eugenie's marriage to Jack Brooksbank would mirror Meghan's ceremony. And people felt like Eugenie was now taking on Meghan's ways and they said that Megan was indirectly blamed for feeding Eugenie's hunger for publicity because she was trying to mir mirror the way I don't really get that statement that seems like people are just you know looking for reasons to be upset with Megan that's not real stuff meanwhile while Megan is being criticized in England and people are starting to have their questions about her and feeling like her behavior and attitude are infiltrating everything in a really negative way Thomas is still giving his interviews he can't be stopped he says in his latest interview, I tell you, I've just about reached my limit on Meghan and the royal family. I'm about to unload on them. Angered by Meghan's latest denial that her father had paid her college fees, he was also infuriated by her assertion to have financed him out of her earnings from suits. Yeah, see, that would have really been upsetting because we know that Thomas took an enormous financial hit to make sure that Meghan was always financially secure. And then, so for her to, for him to say that Megan was over there helping him, we know that she wasn't. She, like, one time gave him a few bucks to put towards a new car, and then I think helped him move house one time. But as far as sending him money all the time, that seemed like a complete and total fabrication of the truth. And Thomas came to that interview with receipts. He produced the bank statements that show that he was still repaying the loans for her college fees after she joined Suits. That is incredible that you would continue to ask your parents for money to pay your college loans 
when you are making good money on a TV show? How could you even straddle your parents with that debt that was your debt when you're making good money? You know, that's one thing if your parents are like, hey, I want to help you out when you get on your feet. I'll, you know, help you pay your college loans. Even that, I'm like, you guys, you have to take care of yourselves. What is this? But even if your parents were in a financial place to take care of that for you while you got on your feet until you could take over the loan and the payments yourself, fine, whatever. But this business of her making good money and she's still being like, dad, you got that? You got that right? Okay, good, because I'm not going to pay for college. Mm -mm. She should be embarrassed. Well, in reply, Megan later would reproach him. She said, you've said I never helped you financially and you've never asked me for help, which is also untrue. You sent me an email last October that said, if I've depended too much on you for financial help, then I'm sorry, but please could you help me more, not as a bargaining chip for my loyalty. Well, I don't know what really happened. I think that one of the things that has become more markedly clear is that Thomas is a a remaker of the facts himself. I think sometimes he sews and stitches together uh, truths to recreate a new narrative. I think Megan is more of the personality where she'll just create a new narrative. She doesn't need to stitch together any facts. I think Thomas is sort of more of the leave things out, add things in, press certain facts over others. I don't know that both of them are reliable narrators, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. Well, Thomas continues, what riles me up is Megan's sense of superiority. She, she'd be nothing without me. I made her the duchess she is today. And he also wants to invoke the name of Diana. Are you guys not also sick with the fact that anytime anyone wants to make a point, they bring Diana into it? It's like, you guys, there were other royals besides her. And also, she wasn't such, you know, so perfect herself. But whenever, I mean, it's almost like calling on the name of a saint. Um, let's all, you know, venerate Saint Diana. Thomas says, they they have Meghan treating her father in a way that Harry's mother, Princess Diana, would have loathed. That's not what Diana stood for. Okay, but you, I mean, you don't really know Diana. I mean, it's all well and good. Yeah, she probably wouldn't like the drama that's going on in the family, but I, I dislike this calling on the name of Diana all the day to make a point. It's just like when people want to make a real point about how people are really terrible and they're always like, Nazis, Hitler. It's like, you guys, there are other things to make your point. Why do you always have to fall back on this one point anyway um then he adds i don't care if harry never speaks to me again i'll survive who cares these days about a dusty old crown okay maybe it's been polished but it's an ancient institution stuck in its ways it's all just sour grapes here because if they'd invited him in wholeheartedly he wouldn't be singing the same ugly tune samantha hustled on up and endorsed thomas if our father dies, I'm holding you responsible, she ran into Megan. The royals are an embarrassment for being so cold. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Act like a humanitarian. Act like a woman. To her critics on social media, Samantha retorted, Megan does not walk on water. She owes our father love and respect. It's morally unconscionable to ignore him, as he's made everything that she is. Okay, well, I think we can all totally agree with the sentiments that both people are saying. Um, I think in this instance, I would agree with Samantha far more than I would agree with Thomas, because I think Thomas is too mad to make sense. But Samantha is at least making sense here. And it is true. If, if Thomas dies, is this the way that Megan wants the relationship to end? Clearly, the man is not in good health. He is very unwell. He's been in the hospital. Um, God forbid something happened to him. Currently... To this moment, Thomas Markle is not well at all. He's had a terrible stroke, which makes, makes it difficult for him to speak clearly. And I would say the death is imminent. Uh, maybe not like tomorrow, but he clearly is on his last few years. Why in the world is Megan continually withholding those grandchildren from him? Probably because they're not real. But other than that, I mean, even far before she'd had kids, why is she behaving this way? He is old. He is unwell. Why? Are you acting this way? And she should be ashamed of herself. And really, if she is a humanitarian, if she does have any empathy, if she does really want to be a wife, mother, daughter, to be lauded in praise, then act like one. The battle about Thomas Markle spread across the airwaves. Then, of course, Sharon Osbourne had to weigh in on it. And I, you know, sometimes Sharon Osbourne says things that are true, and other times it's just like, girl, you really did take a lot of drugs. Um, and then this is one of those instances where she probably should have just shut her mouth because she decided to jump on this bandwagon. And Thomas, Tom Bauer says, 
Sharon Osbourne, a TV chat show host famous for confessions about her own life of violence, drugs, alcohol, and adultery, expressed her sorrow to millions of viewers for dignified Megan's discomfort because she felt so, because she must feel so humiliated and so embarrassed by her father. Accusing Thomas Markle of being disreputable, not least after being photographed carrying four cans of beer. She sniped, It's so obvious that you have a bad drinking problem. Get yourself clean and sober and then come back. Thomas Markle, by the way, was photographed taking the beer to the guards on his compound, not for his own enjoyment. So maybe get your facts straight, Sharon. Um, and so this is what happens when we don't care about the humanity of other people. We just jump on a bandwagon and want to talk about others. I know a person could say, well, isn't that exactly what you're doing with this show? You're just talking about other people. But I think one of the things that I think is essential is when we talk about what's going on in the media and this, I mean, there's everybody's talking about the same story in one capacity or another. These people's names keep coming up. I think it's really important to talk about people as the human beings that they are with dignity and worth. And when we decide to make blanket statements and we decide that we are firmly and completely fixed against trying to find the motivation behind why they did what they did, then we end up resorting to this kind, these kinds of mean statements, you know, claiming that Megan is the one that's dignified and claiming that her father is the one with a bad drinking problem. It's like, well, but Sharon Osbourne, are you, you of all people should be a lot more passionate and empathetic to somebody who might be having a lot of family drama you rebranded your family based on drama and now you want to come out and attack somebody else's for uh, for having an embarrassing family situation i think maybe of all the people in the whole entire world you should sit down and not talk all right well samantha continued to talk she said i'm worried that my father will die of sadness i just want megan to get in touch before it's too late you don't just throw family away like like a pair of shoes all true things um and i if, if, if Samantha wanted to say these things on Twitter or wherever she's saying it, fine, whatever. And I think that she feels in a panic too because she does see how upset her dad makes her. But I also think that this was a, and you guys, I could be completely wrong. But because I think that Samantha always felt like she played second fiddle to Megan in her father's affections, to now get to rise up and be like, she's being the bad daughter and I'm being the good, feels really cathartic to, for all those years when she felt like she was on the back burner. Do you guys know when you, like, my kids do this all the time. Do you know, like, if you tell one of your kids, like, when, when you have to correct one of your children, like, one of your kids is wilding out or being disrespectful or whatever, and you'll say to the kid, you'll correct the kid, and then the other kid will come up to you and, like, give you a big hug and be like, Mom, I love you. And it's like, that's sweet, honey. I'm glad that you do. But I also feel like maybe you're just giving me a hug to show how much better you are than your brother right, right now. And... That's kind of what I feel like is happening here. I'm not saying that Samantha doesn't love her dad. I'm Because, you know, I know that she does. And the same way that I know my, my kid really loves me. I just think it's interesting that the, the time that they decide to come give me a hug is right after I corrected the other kid. So I feel like what we're seeing here is Megan. I, I feel like we're seeing Samantha kind of enjoy being the, the close one to Thomas. Um, she decided to take it one step further beyond just supporting her father publicly. She was going to get some damn answers. She was. Oh, in the midst of Thomas Markle coming out and damning the palace and the sun as secretive Scientologists and cult-like, this is what I'm saying when I tell you he's off the rails, um, and as he's trying to ridicule them and saying they're like a Monty Python sketch and mocking the idea of apologizing to them, uh... Samantha decided that it was time for her to go and speak up for the family in person. So she headed for London. With cameras summoned, she would arrive in her wheelchair at the gates of Kensington Palace to see Meghan. But of course, as soon as she got there, she was denied entry. So she left a letter addressed to Duchess Meghan and urged her sister not to leave their father hung out to dry. Why expend the energy, Samantha? Why? Why even bother? There's, I mean, that is what I'm saying. You can say your piece, but don't waste time, energy, and financial resources on this. I mean, who knows? Maybe these cameras that followed her were backed. Maybe that is who financially backed her so that she could arrive at the gates of Kensington Palace. But talk about a letdown to show up and then all you can basically do is just sort of shove a letter between the bars of the gate and, you know, wheel yourself down the road. No other member of the royal family had suffered as much embarrassment for their, from their own family as Meghan. There was some equivalence in Meghan's contempt for Samantha and Thomas, and now Harry's for Kate and William in particular. 
The Cambridges, she believed, were failing to offer the recognition and generosity she deserved. She hated the comparisons with uncomplaining Kate. Effortlessly, the Cambridges appeared to be perfect. She appeared to be influenced by envy of Kate. In turn, the future queen regarded her neighbor as dismissive of other people. Meghan's manners towards her staff, Kate observed, had become self-centered, manipulative, and demanding. The staff's complaints inflamed Meghan's growing sense of victimhood. Kate, she explained, did not have to live with the latest irritating revelation, such as the Urban Dictionary's newly published definition of being Meghan Markled, which is a verb for ghosting or disposing of people once you have had no use or benefit from them anymore without regard to genuine human relationship. Well, Megan, if Kate looks good, it's because she's acting good. Do you know what I mean? It's like this is exactly like in Spare when Harry cried and cried because the media kept saying that he was falling out of pubs drunk and, you know, drunk as a skunk and looking like a mess. But he was falling out of pubs drunk as a skunk and looking like a mess. If you don't want people to say that about you, then don't look like that. You have a lot of power in how people perceive you. So do things that help your image. Well, Megan couldn't be bothered to change, but she just wanted to sit around and complain. Megan was really stung by that criticism. Um, the Urban Dictionary definition really, really bothered her, uh, probably because it was a truth that she could not deny, and there was a reason why people were saying this about her. Even though Megan became increasingly fragile and demanding of the palace staff to view the world from her perspective, she didn't seem to care if people liked her or not. She didn't want people to say bad things about her, but she didn't really care if people didn't like her. You know, so it's like that Urban Dictionary thing. She wasn't offended about it because it was true. It's just that it wasn't a, it wasn't positive. So she's not going to fix her behavior. She just doesn't want people to comment on it. I don't know what world she thinks she's living in where people are just going to continually ignore and not mention or comment how she acts. In self-defense, she demanded retaliation against her critics. She urged Harry to become more combative. And in turn, she urged Knopf to protect his wife. Now, this is where I want to talk to you guys about how I think that Kanaf is either dangerously naive for a spokesperson, or perhaps he had something going for Megan. I'm not saying that the two of them are doing anything. I'm just saying I think that he is giving into her in a way that belies his secret affection. Eager to oblige the Sussexes, Kanoff accepted Megan's version that in the months before her wedding, her difficult father had rejected a loving daughter's offers to help. He also assumed that her father's heart illness was suspicious and the hiatus which occurred in the days before the wedding was entirely Thomas's fault. And this is what I'm telling you when I say that he's dying dangerously naive to be this spokesperson. Person. Why is he believing this? There's enough evidence. And why was he never taking Thomas's calls himself? Thomas says he had Jason's number. So unless Megan had potentially given him a number that was false, why was Jason never reaching out and talking to Thomas himself? You know, that's an idea I'd never thought about. If potentially Megan had given her father a number that never was intended to go to Jason at all. Because it seems wild to me that Jason, who is supposed to be in charge of the couple's image, wasn't reaching out to the dad and being like, hey, let's get your story. What's going on here? Why can't you and Megan get along? Kanoff did not notice that whatever Megan believed became a fact. In her mind, she decided that what she believed was true. And there was no possibility of contradiction. Contradiction of her truth was persecution. As she would say, when you really know who you are and you know what your belief system is, you live by the truth. And I think you can start to peel away the layers of where the fear comes in. Okay, what does any of that mean? Megan's attitude towards truth was common among Hollywood celebrities. In their new religion, the concept of a universal truth was false. As she told an audience, life is about storytelling, about the stories we tell ourselves and the stories we're told and what we buy into. She sincerely believed that everyone had the right to create her, her own truth uh, about the world. And that is stupid 101. All right. How in the world are you going to live a life in which your truth um, trumps anybody else's truth? That just doesn't e that's not even cohesive with functioning reality. Uh, anyway, uh, at the same time, amid all this persecution because people wouldn't believe her truth, she decided that she would cozy back up to George and Amal Clooney and hosted on his private jet. They went to Lake Como. 
Amid extraordinary luxury, she discussed how difficult it was to cope with this medieval monarchy. It sounds like it's real terrible, Megan. 